the reason why I think it's important is because I also want to recapture like the little old lady, very, you know, like very simple person who says, God will take care of me. Because that's in that mode. It's like, I actually don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen. But I have a, an orientation, something like, I know that God wants the best of me. And the thing is that that might mean that you're going to get dragged in the street and you're going to get killed and like all these horrible things are going to happen to you. But that mode of anticipation is the best mode to stand in in order to face whatever horrible thing the future has in front of you. Right. And it's, and it's not predictive. That's right. It's not at all predictive. It's, it's just a stance, which is like all is, that is given will be taken as the grace of God. This is Jonathan Peugeot. Welcome to the Symbolic World. How do we do this? Is there a structure? Probably not. <laughs> Usually in the, in the YouTube situation, there's one person in charge because it's their channel. Yeah. And so it's like, <laughs> we kind of know who's in charge of what. Yeah, there's always this, uh, at least implicit. Um, what? Well, uh, go ahead. No, no. no. Well, okay. <laughs> you, you see, we're from Canada. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, so um, there was a question I mentioned to you and Paul, and we'll, perhaps we can start there. But we don't have to stay there. We yeah. won't stay there. Yeah. But, uh, um, so I picked up on your theme of sacrifice, letting go, a kind of death, mm-hmm. as being very, very central uh, to coming into right relationship with reality. I, I, is that a fair thesis? Yeah. To at least one part. Yeah. Good. And then I took it, and I, uh, I took it into uh, a particular state of orientation. Uh, because if you maintain the orientation you have towards all the beings or um, all the creatures, if you want to use more biblical language, right? Um, that's not the right, or that's not the right stance mm-hmm. to be in relationship with being or the grounded being, ultimate reality, whatever God. Yeah. If that's fair enough, uh, I think. And, and you can't use a thing to think to come into right relationship with no thingness. Um, and I, I thought that thesis was reasonably derivable from your thesis. Uh-huh. Um, and I think you find, that, uh, I, I'm not claiming their equivalence because I don't want to step on doctrinal toes, but there's significant uh, similarities between theosis uh, and other states like that in other traditions. And you've acknowledged that in the past, so I don't mm-hmm. think that's a point where we get, we get stuck or anything. Uh, but then it came to me that that point is in tension, and I hope it's tonos and not just tension, with something we were also apparently all agreeing on, which is the, the, the need for a significant revival, reinventio of, uh, of ritual and symbol. And yet ritual and symbol seem to bind us to creatures, to things, to particulars. And then there seems to be a tremendous tension, yeah. at least initially. Is that fair? Oh, no, I think, I think it's fair. Um, I think that, let me toss something in so we can kind of have a few things going. One of the things that I was thinking about yesterday when we were thinking about the question of uh, the origin, um, the, the past and the future, yeah. and the notion of, of how we exist between the two. Yes. Uh, and I, I started realizing, because St. Maximus talks about the logos as both the origin and the telos, mm. right? The alpha and the omega, right? The beginning and the end. And, and I, I started to realize that, let's say, if you think about that image you have of the campfire, and they go out, yeah. when they leave the campfire, they're, they're both remembering the past and the future. Yes. Right? So the idea that you can remember the future is very, it's very important, because you do that every time you're doing any task. Right? If, you're, if you're building something, you're remembering the future. You're, mm-hmm. you're always remembering what the, the telos is, but that telos is the reason why you're doing the thing in the first place. Mm-hmm. And so, I, and the reason why I bring that up is, of course, it reflects on the choices that I made 
in trying to reawaken the a kind of, let's say, a, a more uh, integrated vision of the world is that I don't think we can do it reinvent. Like, mm. I really don't think we can reinvent. In some ways, our origin is given to us. Mm. Right? It, it comes, like I, I mentioned that yesterday, it comes down from heaven. That sounds like a weird thing to say, but it, it ha- we, we're given uh, an origin. There are moments that people participate in, in origin moments, but you can't, it's a kairos, right? You can't make that up. You know, you, you kind of, it just, things just happen to be in this right place at the right time with the right people. And then it's almost as you're doing it, you realize that now is a, there's an origin uh, of something happening. Um, yeah, and so because of that, I tend to go back to, this is something that my brother developed, by the way, if, if you, everybody probably knows, knows about him, but I want to acknowledge that this idea came from him. He uses the, 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 the trope of um, promised land and exile mm-hmm. as a structure to understand the bigger meaning crisis. That there seems to be in the Bible a, a structure which is the place where you find your home, your identity, and uh, communion, and then a place where that breaks, and all of a sudden, things don't make sense. You're in the land of the foreigner. It's foreign gods. You know, you can't uh, have cohesion. And what he does is he applies that to the whole problem. So the scientific development, the scientific revolution, the enlightenment, scientism, and that thinking is in some ways a, uh, it's a moment of exile. Mm-hmm. But that, so, so it's part of the bigger patterns. Like it's, in some ways, I don't think, that, it's not something that hasn't happened before. Although our version is accelerated. But I see in history moments when this breakdown and exile uh, happens. And there, it seems like there are certain things that you can do when you're in that moment. Repent, remember, um, like Jonah, right at the bottom of the waters, it's like, remember the holy place, turn, turn, reorient yourself towards that, the, the origin, which also becomes the, the telos. Uh, and so I think that explains a little bit why, and when I look at how Christians did it, when Christianity, when the, the world changed from the Roman Empire, let's say, to the Christian world, it wasn't as much a break as some people want to represent it. Because in, you can see in Dante, or the greatest example of that, in the way that Dante formulated his cosmic image, he integrated all the Roman sure. uh, yeah. myths with the Christian story into a kind of synthesis. That was, that was good. Okay, so, so first of all, the, on the initial point, I don't use the word invent or mm-hmm. reinvent. I use inventio, which is a Latin word, which means simultaneously to make and to, dis- and to discover. Okay. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a verb of active participation, mm. not of making. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's, right, it's like reinventio is to, to turn back to the inventio place. Uh, I, and that's what I meant earlier when I was talking about dialectic into dialogos. There's practices you can do, but you can't make dialogos. Yeah. It's not an artifact, right? It, it, you can do things, you can, just like a fire, you can make all the conditions uh, that increase the chances it will catch, but it has to catch of its own accord. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in complete agreement, I think, okay. with the first point. Um, uh, that's why I'm, I, I, I'm very careful to use that word rather than the English word invent, because invent, especially in America, invent, yeah. invent means it's, this. Wait, we have, we have this idea of innovation. Yes. It's, a, we have, it's like our God, this idea yeah. of innovation. No, yeah. for, for, so for me, and that's why I use, I use more often the, meta, the metaphor of befriending. You can't make somebody your friend, mm. you, but you, it's not like you're passive, though. Like you have to set yourself, you have to orient yourself, you have to make yourself available, and then, and then there's a possibility that friendship will, will, will spark. So first of all, that's, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about there. Um, second, um, I think very much um, the understanding this as a kairos is right, and, um, and this is, uh, the next point is something I, I even independently worked on, but uh, D.C. Schindler also talks a lot about in the critique of pure reason is uh, the idea of synoptic integration. Uh, the idea is, uh, and, and, and this is also countercurrent in a big way, believe me, I know this, because we have, we have, we've, ha- we've had these two channels uh, in the West and they, they su- they're superimposed on each other, which is uh, bureaucratization and specialization. Um, and like I mentioned last time, it's a significant problem in psychology. Like, you think the people who did work on meaning in life and, and belonging 
would talk to each other. Would talk to each other, and they don't, right? And so um, I think a way in which we're gathering the logs so that the fire can spark is, and this is what I do in cognitive science, and what I'm trying to do even more broadly, uh, integrate with, trying to integrate with your work and, and a very respectful, in philia, right, and with David, David Schindler's work and Paul, and, right, is to achieve uh, that state of uh, the broadest possible synoptic integration that can make available, I think, what you're talking about. So, yes, the Christians didn't just, right? And that's what I also try and get with the word steal the culture mm -hmm. as opposed to, like, make a revolution, yeah, or, yeah, yeah. right? Like, what you're doing is, you're, yeah, you're, it's, you're, you're taking the Logos' ability to gather things together so they belong together, so that you can give an account and to which you are accountable, all that stuff. And you, I'm try, I see that as a project of, like it's simultaneously, the Logos is spinning, trying to get it to spin out more and more, and also try to more and more co coalesce together in an integration. That, mm -hmm. That's very much the project. So the, the, there's a way in which in the moment of exile, the moment of exile actually has an advantage. It's hard to understand it, but if you look at the stories in scripture, exile is the place where you get riches. Uh, ex exile is the place where your body grows. It's the you said riches? Yeah. I thought you said witches. No. That was weird. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you can. Maybe you gather a few of those too. But uh, it's mostly the place where you get you, you get you get riches. And so that, that's the place where you increase your body. Is the, is the place to, to think about it. And you can think about it very simply, right? When your your very coherent worldview starts to shatter, yeah. things start to, to to grow too much, and then they disconnect from the origin. Uh, but that also adds possibility. Yes. If you're ever capable of reconnecting them, then all of a sudden your capacity is, is so much more because more is now connected to the top. Yeah, I think of Kairos as the, remember how at the level of attention and then at the level of the distributed cognition, you have the dispersal and variation and then you have the selective return to, to the coalescing center. Yeah. Your brain is doing that, culture's doing that, and I think in Kairos, what you're just describing is exactly that. You go into the wilderness, you break the frame, so variation mm -hmm. is now possible, right. and then that new <clears throat> variation gets drawn back in to something. And it's the T.S. Eliot poem, we return to the center after all of our journeying, and we know it again for the first time. Like, yeah. there's a sense of sati, you remember it and you refit, but you also, it's like when, when people say, it's the anamnesis, when people are in the, the when, when Dialogos catches and people say, I've always been looking for this, uh, but I no, didn't know what I was looking for. It's, that, it's the memory that's also a discovery. That's why, for me, I, I, that's what I'm trying to get with that word inventio. Yeah. It's like, oh, I was always looking for this, but I didn't know kind of thing. So, so and I think what's, what's important, at least for me, because I always complain about the modern world, everybody knows, but there is a way, there's a way in which, because uh, one of the problems we have is always that there's a line of thinking, there's a line, a philosophical line, which tends to see you know, all manifestation or, or, ver or variation as a kind of decomposition. You know, yeah. The, the idea that, that it's immediately evil because as soon as it moves into variety, that yeah. whole kind of Gnostic strain. But when, if you understand that the moving out into exile actually has a function to then re recapture or, re or yeah. bring in more into the pattern, then all of a sudden the, the, the pattern of exile and the idea of kind of breaking home Right, or losing of domicile even, yeah. can, if, if reoriented, capture more of the, of the world. Yeah, that's exactly it, yeah. right? right? Uh, and so that, 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 that you know, this, the, the, the sort of maximal possible frame breaking for the mac, maximal frame making, like in, like, like in a systemic insight. You know, sometimes you have, like, you have an insight into like the, a problem, and then you have in, an insight into a set of problems like, like your relationship hasn't been going right. And it's not like, you know, well, how do I do the nine dot problem? It's like, oh, wait, wait, wait. All of these problems have this nexus. And if I address this nexus, they all, a, a, a systemic insight, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And, and so there's that, that breaking and making. But my, the point I want to get at, to bring it back to the original point is, what is the most appropriate stance to maximal frame breaking yeah. that will allow for the metanoia return to the center? And that's what I was proposing, this stance of the most original orientation we have, yeah. which is this stance towards 
because th this is the stance that keeps all the possibilities available, but not in a not not in they're not they're not disoriented, right? And I, that's what I was trying to get to this place. What I was talking about that I see at least shared in theosis and, uh, and nirvana and Tao, right? This place where right you're, you are right you've let go of trying to hold on to like because as long as you're thinking thinking in a thingy fashion, you're holding on to the framing that bounds and makes them those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And if you really are prepared, you really want to let go of the framing, right? You have to let go of that way of thinking. You have to get to this original orientation state in order to be at the appropriate place on the horizon, right? So that you can be open to what you're talking about, the, the, the new possibilities, without giving up being oriented, because mm -hmm. if you give up being oriented, then you're screwed, because yeah. then you're just tumbling yeah. through the nothingness, right? Does, does that make no, sense? No, that, that... I think that's exactly what I, that's exactly what I think. The, the image that I, that I have in Exodus, there's a, that seems to be what's happening. When Israel leaves Egypt, right, breaking, every frame, yeah, frame yeah, breaking, yeah, yeah. and they also leave with a bunch of other people, like everybody thinks like Israel left Egypt, no, it says it was a mixed multitude, it was just a bunch of people, who, uh, yeah. Israelites, all kinds of other people, riffraff, who knows, it was like this, just this massive, in, unformed thing that goes out into the desert, right, that goes through the waters, that dies, that loses its previous yeah. identity, and then there's a process of covenant and of receiving law from above and a reestablishing of hierarchy which binds everything together some of it has a, some of it has a communion aspect to it some of it has also a kind of cutting off the the dead wood aspect yeah. of it which yeah. is which is a harsher part but you can kind of understand that i mean the reason why i'm talking about this so much is is that uh, is that I do have hope, ultimately, because I sometimes express a lot of hopelessness, but I really do have hope that this story of even the meaning crisis and the breakdown and everything is necessarily leading to a higher participation and to a, a, big, like a bigger frame. It's just that while it's happening, things are falling apart and a lot of crazy idols appear and all these little gods start to, start to poke through and want to get the attention and want to take, take it for themselves. But it seems like that, 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 that it's, in some ways, like the, I even, the, even Christianity, I've, I've said this before, that the death of Christianity seems to be part of yeah. how it's going to happen. I really and how it's going to saying that. Sorry, I, I really admire you saying that because it takes guts to say that, especially when I presume there's a lot of Christians here. Yeah, but I don't mean to stop being a Christian. I just mean uh, to and, die. And I'm not saying you are. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like saying that, but you know. Uh, no, no, you no, no, but first of all, I, I, I'm trying to afford you a possibility uh, to, to frame that a little bit more yeah. complete so people can see um, the positive intent behind the statement. Um, and, but... Uh, because there's an analog to what you're saying in the Exodus story. An entire generation has to die. Yeah. An entire generation has to die. And Moses can't go in to the promised land. Like the leader and the entire generation. When it was just what, what Caleb and Joshua, they get to yeah, go in. It's the, yeah, it's the, the savior and the dog. Right. Because <laughs> yeah, Caleb, mean, one of the readings of Caleb is dog. Right. He's actually not an Israelite. He's a, he's a Kenizzite. So it's like the inside and the outside, like the, the inner pillar and the outer pillar, are the ones that create the new world. It's a, it's a beautiful image, actually. It's kind of painful to think about. But, but, there, but there is, and th that reminds me, um, this might strike you as an odd uh, analogy, but it reminds me of Thomas Kuhn um, in The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, and he talks about you know, when there's a paradigm shift, and, uh, and, yeah. and, and one, of the th one of the primary mechanisms of paradigm shift is the leaders of the previous paradigm die. Mm -hmm. it's, human mortality actually is one of the facilitators of a paradigm shift in science. Uh, they, have to, they have to die uh, because you don't derive the new paradigm. It's like your idea of faith is leaping from one level to yeah. another. When you shift a paradigm, you can make sense of the previous paradigm retrospectively, but you can't generate it prospectively. And so there's a, there's a real death um, that makes possible a new generation yeah. that creates the paradigm shift. Is, is, does that? No, that, I totally agree. And yeah. I think that, that that's the image. I think that when we talk about eschatology, eschatological imagery, it seems to be the way to formulate it. It's formulated as a 
crazy image right yeah. there of a guy sitting on a throne with a sword coming out of his mouth and he's judging between what is inside and outside and he's reestablishing the law and it appears almost mythologically but we know that it's going to happen because that's how the world works we uh, we know because we experience it at little levels where things die and then they they kind of come back up at at higher in higher to higher participations and we also notice even not just in time but in in the ontological hierarchy itself, how that works, how for things to participate in higher beings, they have to give up some of their idiosyncrasy, mm -hmm. right? Like a, like a family meal, like you have to give up your idiosyncrasy to be able to commune with everybody else or a sports team or whatever. And so the, the, the mythological image in some ways is, the, it's like you're formulating, the, print, you're formulating the, the pattern itself, saying this is how the world works. Here's, an, here's a limit version of it. Right? And it has this, this imagery to it. Uh, uh, but so, so I want to make sure I'm getting, because I think this is a crucial point, yeah. sorry. So what I'm hearing you saying is, the, the, so this imagery is obviously imaginal. It's helping you to become aware of things you're not typically every day aware of. And, and that awareness is sort of like of the fundamental grammar of reality, which is what you need to drop back to when you're in this space of the wilderness, because that's, the, that's all that remains, is that sort of fun, is that, is it? Well, no, you're, that's, exact, that's exactly right, but it gives you a way, because this is the problem, right? It's like, how do you, how do you live in the future, how do you orient yourself towards the future? The future's yeah. not there. Yes. It's just not there yet. You don't know what it's going to look like, but what you have is this image, this eschatological image, and the uh, kind of mythological image of what the future is, and that makes it possible for you to move towards re-enchantment or a re-appropriation yeah. without knowing exactly what that's going to look like in the, in the nitty-gritty details. Right, right. So, so this to me sounds like the way the imaginal is at work in orientation. So uh, I don't know if I've, I can't remember where I've given this. this. <laughs> so this is based on a lot of work by Hirschfeld and others. You go into a, um, uh, a university where at least the people believe that they're the best um, in rational thinking and the use of education. Um, uh, and you present them with absolutely clear argument and evidence that they should start saving for their retirement mm -hmm. right now. You take all their challenges, you respond to it, they all agree, yes, I should start saving. You come back in six months and none of them are saving for the retirement, none of them. And then you do something else, you say, okay, uh, what I want you to do is, well, first of all, let me say what the problem is. The problem is people don't want to connect to their future self. Mm -hmm. Because your future self is, I mean, I'm facing retirement, so this sort of looms. Um, your future self is older, uglier, weaker, and unimportant. <laughs> right? Um, and so instead, what they did is they said, no, and notice the language here. I want you to imagine, but this isn't imagine, I want you to imagine your future self as a beloved family member that you've always cared for mm -hmm. and that you have, and you, you, and you have tremendous compassion and concern for. When they come back in six months, the people are saving. If they did the, and so the variables are, do they do the practice? Yeah. If they do the practice, they save. And how vividly they do the practice predicts how much they save. Right? This is what I mean about how the imaginal is necessary for the rational, where the rational doesn't mean the inferential, because all mm -hmm. the inferences were there in the first experiment. What it means is the ratio, the orienting you and proportioning you properly towards the future. Now, that doesn't mean they're getting an accurate, the point isn't, is, yeah. isn't an accurate prediction of their future self. The point is this ratio religio, this proper orient, properly proportioned orientation. Is, is that how these... I, this is what I'm hoping, and, and, and some people might not understand why I'm harping up on this, because... I, I do. You know, because I want, and I think, to me, this is crucially important at this moment, is to, is to be able to formulate a form of eschatology which is not fortune-telling. Yes. Right, which is not like, in so many years, this, this sign is going to happen, and this and that, and this and that. I'm not saying there aren't signs and there aren't things that happen, but I think that, that, that approaching the eschatology this way is giving, it can give us a solution. Because people hear me, and I know I freak people out, right? I freak people out because I talk about AI and I compare it to the beast in, uh, in the revelation. And then people think, oh, Jonathan is saying it's the end of the world. Uh, it's like, I'm telling you, this is, the, this is the imaginal pattern 
that was projected into an indefinite future, an eschatological future, that distills what civilization and technology is. And now I can look, use that as a model, and I can look into the world, and I can see instantiations approaching or moving away from that model. So isn't right. it like a lens that allows you to see better to the horizon rather than a model that you're looking at even? No, it's like, yeah, it's a, it's a frame of, it's like a frame of vision yes. that yeah. now permits you then to look at the details of the world and to be able to make sense of what's going on. So to me, so when I say that, I really do believe that, let's say, AI is moving towards the image of the beast in Revelation. Uh, and I can, and it's not just like a, how can I say this? It's not just like an arbitrary description of something that I read in the text that I can see, oh, it's this, like, oh, you put a number, right? When you were young, you probably had this thing, like, they're gonna put a number on your hand, and then you, yeah, yeah, and as yeah. soon as someone talks about tattoos, you're like, oh, that, that's gonna be it, like, they're gonna yeah. put a number on your hand. But it's like, it's rather to understand the imagery as something which is manifesting the extreme limit of certain aspects of reality. Right. And then they can kind of come back and they can help us understand. But and, and, uh, uh, the reason also why I'm talking about this is because that's what we, at least in the Orthodox Church, that's the way it's set up. Mm -hmm. So when you look at an image of Jesus in an icon, you're looking at the eschatological Jesus. Even an icon, a normal icon of Christ, when you see him with the book and his hand, that's Christ returning. That's, uh, that's the actual typology that you have. So you're looking at the future when you're looking at an icon of the of, right. of Christ, like you're looking at the future, but the eschatological but, future piercing in, but not predictively. That's no, what not exactly, not predictively. It's it's a it's typological. It's it's a, it's an image. It's man. It's the it's the divine man. It's all that, and in some ways, it's that's what that's what's drawing us further, like drawing us into itself. So the, the thing about predictive is it gives you cognitive closure. That's why we seek it in science. And what you're talking about this imaginal orientation, this eschatological, is. It's orienting to you the future, but it's, it's leaving space for real emergence, for real uh, un, uh, uncertainty, right? Yeah. Because uh, no one knows the hour when, and, yeah. And, and, yeah, right? And yeah. there's, the example is, right, everybody who's a Christian knows the, the, the prophecy, Elijah will come before the Messiah. Yeah, that's a beautiful typological understanding. You understand what Elijah did. He kind of, you know, what his function was, how he kind of mocked the, the foreign gods. He cleared the, the, the room. Jezebel died. Like, that's okay. All that's going on. And then Christ says, Elijah is John the Baptist. <laughs> all right. Is anybody willing for that kind of interpretation today? Like, is there, are, are a lot of people capable of doing that now where it's saying the same thing? Now, looking at the imagery that is presented, for example, in Revelation, and not and, and just say, oh, here's an instantiation of that. Like this is the this is the Elijah, right? This is the thing. It's not it's not a it's not a it, like I said. It's not a map. It, a map in the, the 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 gross sense. It's a map in the sense of a of a frame of of seeing. Yes. So here I, I, I want to do two things. And I'll try to do both as quickly as possible. One is I want to give back to you how what, how radical your proposal is, uh, which I sometimes do with you. <laughs> Uh, because does it sound radical to you guys? Uh, I'm going to try and make it more radical. I don't think so. If you're going to make it more radical, no, 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 no. It's it's not radical in speech. Yeah. Okay. That's not what I. That's not what I'm. And remember, ra radical also means to return to the origin point. Mm -hmm. Radical return to the origin point, so you can reorient. Right. Well, that's the that's the original meaning. Um, Just published a paper last year, integrating relevance realization, recursive relevance realization with predictive processing theory. These are two huge frameworks. Um, there's two meta problems that you have to solve to solve any problem. One is the relevance realization problem. The other is you want to, as, as much as possible, you want to anticipate rather than react. In fact, you can sort of measure the intelligence of a being by the scope of its abilities to anticipate. And what your brain is, is it's a, it's a massive predicting machine. Uh, uh, at uh, 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 many levels of abstraction, predicting the next second, predict, like it's doing all of this in this really complex recursive fashion. I won't get into the, uh, the and oh, I like surprises. No, well, you like surprises that are uh, uh, momentary failures of prediction that, that increase your, predict, your long-term prediction capability. You don't like absolutely uh, irreversible no. surprises. Those are horrible, Those, that's terror. <laughs> right? Um, yeah, you like surprise birthday parties, but if at the surprise birthday parties they pull out knives, then you're afraid. Like, 
No, I didn't want that surprise. Not that surprise. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I, want, I want people to really talk, sink into that, to savor that. I think this is an incredibly plausible um, understanding. Um, such that, for example, and this, is, this comes into the heart of a lot of therapy even, the brain prefers predictable unhappiness over surprising happiness. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the ways in which people get, um, uh, some of your language perhaps, I think that's one of the ways in which people can get bound into like sin, right? That they can get locked um, in a kind of unhappiness that they can't let go of because of how it plugs into that. I'm not saying yeah. that's the theological meaning. So what I'm trying to get at is to move into a mode in which, because I struggle against with this with scientists, yeah. to, to move into a mode of orientation where you are trying to properly orient to the future but not be in the predictive frame, it's radical. It goes to the okay. fundamental yeah. guts of how the brain is working. Does that? Yeah, but, no, but I think the reason why I think it's important is because I also want to recapture like the little old lady, very, you know, like very simple person who says, you know, uh, God, God will take care of me, right? That little statement. Okay. okay. Because, that's, because that's, that's in that mode. It's like, I actually don't know what's going to happen. Right? I don't know what's going to happen. But I have, a, I have a, an orientation, which is to say, or something like, I know that God wants the best of me. And the thing is that, that might mean that you're going to get dragged in the street and you're going to get killed and like all these horrible things are going to happen to you. But that mode of, of anticipation is the best mode to stand in in order to face whatever horrible okay. thing the future has in front of right. you. And it's, and it's not predictive. That's right. It's not at all predictive. It's, it's just a stance, which is like but all is that is given will be taken as the grace of God. But... Do you understand why I mean it's psychologically radical to mm. take that stance? Because like I just said. Yeah, I don't do it. I don't know what to tell you. I wish I did. <laughs> I wish I did. Okay. I okay. know people that do more than I do. So, but, so there's, there's one thing about the stance from the outward orientation and one about the, the taking up of the stance. One is to not confuse uncertainty with risk. So one of the things we've, we've convinced ourselves is that we can capture all uncertainty. Risk is calculable, unwanted things. Uncertainty is things that can't be calculated. Mm -hmm. And we have tried since the Enlightenment to convince ourselves that we can capture uncertainty with risk calculation. And what's coming out, what's been coming out in the history of physics and science and all kinds of things is you can't translate uncertainty. You can translate some uncertainty into risk. Of course you can, right? But there's a lot of uncertainty. If there's, if there's real emergence, then there's real uncertainty. Mm. So first of all, that. Because one way we try and sneak in is we, 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 we sort of, people are placing their bets. On yeah, the, yeah, right, yeah. right? And th that's not this. You're not before the roulette wheel. That's not what's happening, what we're talking about here. I'm really trying to make this as radical mm. as possible. And then on taking it up, I heard three things in you. I heard these three virtues, humility, trust, and hope. I want to start with the one that I have the most difficulty with, uh, and I don't just mean philosophically, I mean personally, which is hope. And first of all, because there, there's two interpretations of Pandora's box. Mm -hmm. The standard interpretation is you let all the demons out, but there's this thing in the bottom, hope, right? And that, and that oh yes, hope, right? That's, the, that's sort of the standard. And then there's the Heideggerian interpretation is hope is the heaviest and worst thing in the box. Yeah. Right, and when you take a it hope, makes all the others even more painful. Yes, exactly, exactly. It, 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 it's a burden. Yeah. Um, and and we all know that there's obviously toxic hope, like the people who stay in abusive relationships mm -hmm. too long, right? The people who misplace their hopes in the Fuhrer, yeah. right? There are all kinds of toxic versions. So uh, uh, perhaps we could. Uh, uh, so I want to talk about all of them: hope and humility and trust. But. What, like, and I know hope is one of the... Yeah, one but of, I would say that, it, the, again, it's the, pro, it's the idea of the proper stance again. That is, what do you place your hope in, right? Because if you place your hope in your spouse completely, then you're, then you're going to lose, right? If you place your hope in the government, in your school, in whatever, in your friends, if you put all of it there, 
then you're going to, then it's not going to work. And I think that that's why the idea of hoping in God, which sounds like a trite statement, is actually very profound in the, in the proper stance, which is that the, 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 my hope is turned towards the, towards the infinite. It's turned towards that no thing, yeah. which is beyond the yeah. things. Uh, and so, but if I put my hope in this or that leader or this or that, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, ex, I'm going, it's going to experience a disappointment, which is important. I, the disappointment actually it might be what leads you towards hoping, putting your hope in the highest. Yeah. But if you look at the, in the Christian story, you know, people, I, sorry if there are any like prosperity gospel people here, but it's like in the early saints, they had their hope in Christ and they were expressing their hope in Christ as people were chopping their head off, like as people were cutting their limbs off and ripping their skins off, their skin off. It's like, okay, that's a little, that's crazy. But in a sense, if you're in that situation, that seems to be the best thing. Uh, it's like a limit version of it, right? It's like if you were in a situation where someone's ripping your skin off, what would be the best stance to have? And the saints represent it as this, whoo, just look as high as possible, you know, and that, that, it doesn't make what's happening okay, but it's the best stance even in the worst situation. This is good. I'm going to present something to you as a foil. Am I making it as extreme as possible by talking about people you getting should. their you skin should. ripped off? You should. Because, <laughs> look, no, if we're, if we're preparing for an open horizon, making, moving to extremity, is the proper stance, the proper way to comport ourselves uh, to what we're talking about. So, so what do you think that, that idea of hope uh, solves the problem of hope in terms of disillusioned hope, or, 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 or do you think it could, at least? Well, what I want to do is I want to, I want to try and get it clearer by the contrast of foil, uh, and, and this is appropriate because this actually happened historically. Uh -huh. um, because there's another response to disappointment. And of course, Kierkegaard plays these two responses off against each other, the night of faith and the night of infinite resignation, right? So there's the stoic response. Mm -hmm. The stoic response is, look, I totally get your disappointment thing, like 100% agree, right? And so don't place your heart in anything that is ultimately disappointing. And then they say, well, how do we determine, like, in a rational manner, what's disappointing or not. Because sometimes what you think is disappointing may not, but you can be confused if you just go off subjective feeling, mm -hmm. right? So, and then they say, well, what you do is you try and put your heart, you try to identify uh, with what is good. Uh, because if you are truly in relationship to what is good, you, you can't ultimately be disappointed. Mm -hmm. And then they say, well, what is it that's always good? And friendship, no. Friendship can turn bad and can, well, wealth, no, I, you know, fame, and they rule, and then they say, what's the one thing that's always good? And their answer is wisdom. Mm -hmm. The cultivation of wisdom is always good. There's no situation in which the endeavor to become wiser can turn, like, turns bad. Wisdom mm -hmm. is, is the good. And, and then that also allows them, because they did, they mm -hmm. also famously faced torture and execution with that. Now, mm -hmm. That's a different, different. Now, I think one, part of your response is and that's grounded in the notion that the logos of wisdom is ultimately oriented towards the logos of being, which gives them, right? So Seneca says, even when you're painted into a corner, you can jump into the sky, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. That kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, so, well, there's a reason why, in, at least in the Christian tradition, Christ is called the wisdom of God. Like yes. The, yeah. the, the, the imagery of wisdom in the Old Testament. There's a duality to it a little bit, but most of the church fathers interpreted that as being the logos. Yes. Yeah. So, what's th and I'm so I'm, the difference I would say between yeah. between the Stoic and the Christian would be that in the in the Stoic it's like a, it's it's a virtue in the sense that it's a it's a principle maybe. Yeah. Whereas in the in Christianity it's a it's it's a person that you follow. It's something, it's someone that you follow. So, so, so let me see if I can strengthen your argument. Yeah. Um, and so part of what you're, I hear you saying, given what we said earlier, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm using, you know that I'm using the term in the sense of icon, right? Um, by saying it's personable is that there, there, that there, is, there is something that, the, that can give you, afford the imaginal engagement in, in, that can reach your grandmother yeah, uh, wait, something like that. Is that, is that it's fair? Something, it's something like that, but it's real. It's not a, I don't, uh, no, no, it's I never not, said, it's I, not a, I, I always make a, a distinction metaphor. between yeah, the imaginal and the imaginary. The imaginary yeah. is not real. Look, 
if predictive processing is right, most of your perception of this floor is imaginal. Yeah. Right? You're imagining it, but it's not hallucinatory because the imaginations are true. Mm. Right? Because, right? Because, like, if I want to walk across this floor, the sensory motor loop is too slow. So my top-down processing is actually predicting. I'm imagining most of the yeah. floor. That gives me the capacity to walk quickly across. So that's when I, the imaginal is in the very guts of your contact with reality. That's how I'm using the mm -hmm. word. Is that, is that okay? No, I think that's fine. I think that's fine. So the claim then is that, uh, uh, and I'm getting, I, I'm understanding this claim better because I've heard you and Paul make it to me uh, several times and each time it, it goes round. And I don't mean that I'm just playing with this. I hope you don't think that. Uh, I, I'm getting clear about what, 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 what the claim here, here is. You know, Christianity has what Stoicism has about the logos to the, the logos to the logos, and that's what's always good. And you can, you can, you can align your logos to the logos. Maximus even yeah, he says that like exactly it. that. Yeah, exactly yeah, yeah, that. yeah. So that's that's not not, not something for. But what you're claim, what you're saying is in the form of a person, and not just person, but also hypostasis person, yeah. right? Um, this hypostasis also means substance and principle. It, it's, it's, we've reduced it to our Lockean notion of what a person is. Mm -hmm. but, so it's person in this fatter sense. Is yeah, that, yeah. Is that no, fair too? Yeah. Okay. And then that gives you imaginal access to binding your logos to the logos in an even more profound yeah, manner. Or re even relational like in yeah. the sense that the way that we experience, ah. and this is why in some ways when we talk about principalities or agency or transpersonal agency is that the best way to engage is with as if you're engaging with an agency yeah not as if you are right? uh, be but it's careful. An as much as uh, you're an agency right as much yeah. as that 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 in some ways the mode of human engagement is through agency and through personhood like that's actually how we we we, we engage uh and so the the claim the claim is important because it's there, there's a you know the reason why there's been so much uh, kind of arrogance about how silly the image of God, the personal God is, and kind of how just trite and ridiculous it is. But I really, I want to propose that when we engage with uh, virtues even, or with, yeah. or with, if we engage with them as models, and of it can, even incarnate models to follow, that is the, that's the realist it's realer than just engaging with it as an abstract principle. So it's like if I, so that's, it's like it's an incarnational way of thinking. So I, I, I follow examples of wisdom. Yes. And wisdom yes. itself appears as, as a type of, of a, of a, of a agency mm -hmm. that I can submit my will to. And so it, it has, it, it changes the world back into a world of, yeah, I mean, sorry. It changes the world back into the, more like the ancient world where you have these agencies which come down on us from heaven and that we can follow. And we, we, don't, we don't see them as abstract principles or as, as forms in the way that Plato saw them, but more, I think, at least myself, more like the way that the pagans saw the gods rather than the way that Plato saw, sees the forms. Well, the Neoplatonism, those two get... That's right. No, I totally agree. Yeah. So... a, a res so, first... I'm going to get you in trouble again by saying things like that. <laughs> the people that are like Jonathan, the superstitious guy, trying to get John to believe in demons or whatever. I defended you. I you, defended you. You did an amazing job. You know, like someone started attacking me and John has been amazing at defending my, my position. But I know it's a radical thing and it's hard for people to get into that, that space because it's... Uh, it's, it's, a, it'll, it's unsettling. Yeah, but if they don't leave the paradigm they're in to get to their space, they're screwed. That's, what's, that's part of the AI thing. And I yeah, think, it's I, part, I, think, I think it is part of the AI thing, but definitely. I, but I want to stick on this point yeah. because there's two things. So first of all, I'm, I think I'm hearing you, and there's a way in which I deeply agree that in order to properly orient logos to logos, it can't just be the cognitive grasp of a principle, it has to be internalizing the stage because you have to be internalizing mm -hmm. yeah. perspective yeah, right, yeah. taking and identity formation. Is that is that's that? That's exactly that's exactly right. Uh, and so I think inter and, and uh, I, I get that. Um, and, and please take this as how I'm understanding it, and I'm not drawing equivalencies here. Mm. But 
that's what I'm trying to do in After Socrates, is I'm trying to give people uh, Socrates as a sage that can give them how to internalize perspectives, identity formation, basically, you know, embodies and enacts. Because that's what Plato's, that's the point of the dialogues. Mm -hmm. The point of the dialogues is to say, look, there's no definition of wisdom, but here's a person who embodies it. And, you, and, and what the dialogues do is they try to, they break you out of trying to come up with a definition in order to, if, if, if when they work in order to orient towards, oh wait, mm -hmm. here's an embodiment and I can do exactly what you're talking about with that. Now, and I'm not, and I, I don't want to, I'm not, I don't want to do... No, no, I, no. I, I, but, so I get, I, I, yeah. I get that, right? And I, I'm not, I make it clear in the series repeatedly, I'm not trying to draw equivalencies between Jesus and Socrates, although I think like in Kierkegaard, putting them into deep dialogue, that's Kierkegaard, yeah. that is, I think it's a very valuable thing to do. I, I, yeah. I think, now, so big yes to that part. And so how can you, so this is, comes back to what I said yesterday, how can you do that in a way that is more than just a mental exercise? So the reason why yesterday, one of the reasons why I brought up celebration is because that's part of it, Yes. right? So worship, and celebration in general is a way to, part, to participate and make these things, you know, it's yeah. like my, by just attending to them and celebrating them, lifting them up, yes. you know, I'm making them models for me to follow. Yes. And with, with, with philosophers, that seems difficult, it's difficult to do. Like unless you would organize like a cult of Socrates, which I don't suggest, I'm not no, suggesting no, that. No, no, I'm not, I'm not uh, suggesting that either. <laughs> well, but, but it seems like that, that that's, in some ways, that that's the, that's the, to me, the true mode of participation engages that. So it's like I, you know, I, I, and I celebrate my father, right? It's like we celebrate the 50th wedding anniversary. We're all there together and we're, we're there and we're recognizing that as something to put up on the pedestal sure. and therefore to follow and to engage with. And it's more, it's not the same as saying, this is a good, these are the principles of a good marriage, you know, you should follow them. Yes. The, uh, the first one is way more real because it, it has that, you know, it, it has exactly all that it needs. It has a kind of uh, liturgical aspect to it where I'm lifting it up and I'm putting it up and I'm saying to everybody, look at this. This is what's valuable. And everybody sure. looks at my parents that they've been married for 50 years and they're like, wow, look at how, that's crazy that they did that. You know, maybe I could do that. You know, I mean, it, it, we don't have those mental, it's not as explicit, but that's how it, that's how it works. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so there's, uh, uh, there's, First of all, an answer, but before I answer, can I put my finger on the problem I wanted to pose? Because the answer will be engaged with that. So the problem you face with everything, all the good points you just made, this is why I wanted to push on person, is our, our sort of established sense of person is a creature, mm -hmm. is a thing, and in therefore, so I'll put aside all the silly, oh, God's a sky wizard. Those people, yeah, I agree. They're, they're, they're by and large sort of idiots because they're, they're, right, they're, com they're, they're comparing the worst form of religion to the best form yeah. of science, which is like, I, I, I can do that with science too. Like, you know, uh, here's Edison and he's a, an example of science and look at how, how crazy and stupid his method is. And look at and let's look at Aquinas and how systematic he is. See, religion is so much better than science. It's a ridiculous. So I agree with do, putting all of that aside. Mm. But I do think there is a point, and right, and I and I think the, the you know Intellic makes this clear. You know, the concern with idolatry is ultimately the concern with right not relating to the ground of being as a being, mm -hmm. right? And so that's. The problem with the imaginal is it focuses you in on a being, yeah. right? And yet, and 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 I, and I know Eastern Orthodoxy really, really wrestled with this: the icon versus the idol. And John Luke Marion is are, are, right, but you see, there's a tension there, right? There's a tension also with focusing on. Do you see that? No, I, 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 if unless I mean this is now I'm going to be very very explicitly Christian, but the if the being. If the being appears as someone who dies, uh, and then that being appears as someone who says something like, you know, not me, but the father, right? Sure. You know. And so the, the point, because the, you don't have a choice, 
right? That's the, that's the problem. You do have to see, or you do have to imagine, you do have to, but if you do that, and then that's what you have, right? You have an image of a man on a cross who's dying, and he's doing it to fulfill the will of the Father. And so what he's, what he's doing is showing how it is a no thing. When it appears as a thing, it appears as an emptying. When it appears as a kind of emptying of itself into the world. Uh, and so it, it helps, it gives you that place of focus. You've got it, but you know that it's not, uh, how can I say that? That it is that emptying and that it only exists in, in, the, in the, the vertical relationship. Okay, now I can answer your question right. to me then, right? Um, uh, because for me, uh, I'm not proposing a cult of Socrates because Socrates empties himself completely in knowing well. that he does not know. Yeah. And then what he does is he is a way of imaginally orienting to the good or the one. And that's the Neoplatonic interpretation mm. of Socrates. And that's how I internalize Socrates as a sage. I'm not trying to build a cult around yeah. Socrates. And so then, let's say the practices around Socrates, like the Lexio Divina, I imagine. Yeah, yeah, Lexio Divina, yeah, for very much. Philosophical contemplation. Uh, but it's Socrates broadly construed. It's Socrates as the exemplar of philosophy as the cultivation, the love, the, the, sh the philia, yeah. the shared love of wisdom, which is always good. Yeah, well, I, I mean, it's de it definitely shows the difference. Like, that's the difference, I guess. Like, that's, the, that's the, the big divide is that in some ways, I think that we do need a cult. Yes. Like, we actually need it. Like, we, without it, <laughs> like, without the cult... We just, we, 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 you know, it, it's not enough to hold all the levels together because what a cult does, sorry, <laughs> you're asking me to be radical. Like, okay, so what the, what the cult does is that because it frames it in, with imaginal language, it makes it accessible to everybody, right? So it's like the most uneducated person can look at a, a, a crucifix yeah. and, the, and the genius in the university can look at the same image and they're both engaging with it at their appropriate level of understanding and of participation, but, but it, it offers that possibility, right? Yes. To all come together, you know, and so the little lady can have a cross in their house and so, 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 so it's totally think, fine. And, and you and Paul make this argument, and you know that I take your arguments seriously and take them to heart. Um, I, gu I guess there's a little bit of pushback. Yeah, you should, because I just had a bunch of crazy stuff. <laughs> Um, it's like, I just imagine all the comments, John, Jonathan says it has to be a cult. So, first of all, like I said yesterday, I think the accusation of a cult um, is just empty. Uh, I think if you re-center cult in cultivation and the cultivating of a sense of the sacred, then I, I agree. Uh, but I, these practices that I'm talking about do that. Um, but I, I want to be... I mean, the, 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 the accessibility scaling problem is, is a real, I mean, I've, res I've been responding to this since the very first you made it. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and again, I, I'm, I'm asking for a little bit of charity to not do the apple and oranges. Yeah. Just, Christianity didn't land that scaling. No. no it took centuries. Yeah. Right, it took centuries, right? And, and, and so it's like, I, no, I, 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 I'm, not, I don't, I, I, I'm not in the place to make the comparison with, like, it, it, it's a little, I'm saying it's a little bit unfair to what I'm talking mm. about in some ways, right? It's like, I don't know. I, and I'm certainly not trying to found a religion, and I keep saying that. Uh, but I th think we're making progress in scaling this more and more. I think there's reason to believe that's the case, and it's certainly not centered on me because I have deliberately made that the case. Because it's, mm. uh, no, but, I don't think I see any of that. Like right. I, 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 I hope you're not thinking that I suggesting that. I don't see any of that. I'm, it's mostly I'm looking. Like I'm trying to, to. I'm trying to. Let's say, I want you to because I feel like I this my this the way that I that I'm presenting it. I think. I, that's the way I think, and so I want you to. There's to, lots to of push resonance. Me. Like I want yeah, you to, yeah. I want you to break what I'm saying. So I'm, yeah, even like if you, I'm trying. To, I'm hoping you can even like poke holes in in, in this idea that in some ways worship is so, necessary for this. Yeah. To function. So th th that's the primary proposition, and, yeah. it, and it's and so. I, what I'm trying to get at is, because, uh, I mean, um, 
you've got the practices till like you've got ultimate concern for what's ultimate in the, and they're, they're, ve they're, they're very much about communing, not just communicating. They're very much about like the, the, the sensing of the leap to the higher level. Um, they're, 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 they're very much about a, a, a sense of like, uh, you know, of, 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 of radical religio connecting grammar to grammar. I've been making that argument in some of the time. So there's definitely awe and sacredness and, and there's definitely celebration. People are sharing about how... So there's, I feel like, and then there's the scalability issue. I get that and I've tried to respond to that. I feel like there's something else you're trying to put your finger on and worship that I'm, I'm not getting. And that's where you want, that's where you're making your, and I mean this as a friend, that's where you're making your stand. And yeah. I want to get clear on that. No, no, that's definitely, I think in some ways that's where, uh, in the sense that I do see, like I do see the, the worship part as being crucial to how things hold together. Yeah. Right. And I see that. Um, not just worship, like true worship, let's say to God, but I see celebration, I use the word celebration, that yeah. you know, when you do something, when you're moving towards a goal, you're, you're necessarily, to some extent, celebrating the thing that you're moving towards. Right? You, you're elevating it above other possible things you're it's doing. It's aspirational. Yeah, there, the, there you yeah. go, that's an, that's, an interesting, that's an interesting way of, of thinking about it. And so at a micro scale, you, you, uh, you know, let's say you're, you're just, you're just, how can I say this? You're just walking towards the door. Well, that is a little ritual that yeah. is recognizing something as good and is lifting it up above all the other, other things you could do and is moving towards it, right? So it's like, it's a little form of celebration. So, so, but, this but, but then the idea is that in order for that to bind more, it has to- Go higher. Go higher, I, obviously. Yeah. Right, but I was trying to, so, Going to the door is relevance realization, yeah. right, right? And then I was trying to say, but you get to a place where relevance realization realizes that it's irrelevant in order to give you the proper stance towards ultimate, and it has to give itself up. Mm -hmm. Now that sounds to me like a, a radical prioritization, a radical lifting up yeah. of, uh, of the no-thingness, uh, 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 of, of, of ultimate reality, of the inexhaustible. Like, isn't that, the, wouldn't that? I, no, I totally agree. But that, I think that, that that's the stance that is something like that stance to stand in front of the no thingness, to stand in front of the infinite and to just, that's all you do, really. There's nothing else you can do except see, not see it, not, or, or just no, make no, a gesture yeah, towards you, it. That, yeah, yeah, Nicholas Acuza is, it, 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 like as soon as you try and grab it, you fall into paradoxes and the paradoxes then it just freeze your mind kind of thing. Yeah. I, I, I totally get that. I'm I, I, like, we might be just turning around in circles at this point. It's possible. Because I mean, I think that definitely like we, every time we talk about this, we push each other further. Like, and then I think we reach the point where we might have to think about it more <laughs> on our own and, and keep going. Uh, I, but I, to I, me, it's I, like, the, okay, so let me just bring it back to the idea of, a, of, the, of the, the, the problem of the meaning crisis and the problem of sure. the home, let's say, yeah. the idea of the spiritual home. Uh, is that, okay, we come back to this idea of that the thing that we celebrate in some ways has to be our origin and in some, some ways has to be our telos. And that we don't totally pick that. No. Like we don't get to decide what that is completely. It, it's revealed to us. Yeah. You know, and even for people that have conversion experiences, they usually don't, it's not like they decided to believe something, right? It's something that, that, that reveals itself. It's, the, it's, it's this thing that revealed itself to us. Uh, and so, and I think that that is, again, is like that is my worry of any project now that tries to like build something, yes. right? To like, to create this new thing. Uh, and that, it's fine to do that as long as it's all the intermediary things. Right? So like, for example, you know, I think estuary is great, and I think that's wonderful. But if I, if I heard estuary trying to replace, let's say, the church. I don't want to replace the No, not the you, church. not you, yeah. but I'm, I'm using, <laughs> then, he's, I'm looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> then, then, I would, then I would become, I would be like, uh, I don't think you have, you don't have what it, you don't have what it takes to do that. Uh, and so, 
Oh, it's on the applaud. <laughs> Just, it's John Van Donk is applauding. Uh, and so I'm worried about all of that. Like we talked about, we talked about certain people that, because th- there's a lot of that going on. Like there is. Yeah. And, and I'm I'm deeply opposed to that too. And I don't want to replace the church. I don't want to replace the mosque. I don't want to replace the synagogue. So th- th- there's a couple things here. Um, one is. I think you might be right about the death and resurrection of Christianity, and uh, and and I think I'm still very open to what that might be, and I try to keep open. To, that's why I keep in discussion with you. So I want to give you that. Um, but a lot of people see the dying, and that's all they see mm. in profound ways, and then that's mixed up with some very bad history. And yeah. they, Christianity is not available to them for that reason. Mm. Uh, and could we nevertheless help those people? And there's two possible responses. One is a nasty response is, no, do, damn them to hell. Or the other is, well, no, they still should be helped. Mm-hmm. And however that turns out, uh, like hopefully what is true and good and beautiful will be at work in that. Mm-hmm. St. Paul talks about capturing every good thought. Yeah. Right? right? Uh, so... The second thing is, part of what I think is going on, and I hear this more in, uh, explic- explicated by Paul, is, well, Christianity has this huge history, and that means it's been put through lots of trials, and therefore, it's more trustworthy in a lot of ways. I think that's a very legitimate argument. The problem is that argument would undermine you adopting Christianity at its origin point. So there's, there's a problem with that argument. It, it gets you very close to performative contradiction mm-hmm. because Christianity was premised on the fact, no, no, we can break from right, the tradition. And so yeah, I don't, I really, I mean, because I'm Orthodox, I don't seem to, th- I don't think that- Well, see, the, but that that's problematic, but that, that's the other problem yeah. for me. And you don't have this problem, and yeah. that's fine. But I see the claim that the Christian reads the Jewish scriptures better than the Jewish p- p- people. Yeah. Very problematic, yeah. as most Jews do. So, yeah, and as most Christians find the Islamic yes. know, claim on yeah, the Yes, Hebrew exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. That's you a would, legitimate concern. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. So that's, 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 that's how I would respond yeah, uh, yeah, to that yeah. point. Yeah. So, so I, I, I think we, we've pushed hope very deeply, um, and I think we've ta- touched on trust uh, quite well. Because um, trust is an interesting one for me. Uh, but I think you've given me a lot to think about. But I think one thing that was still sort of has been left implicit is like this virtue of humility. Mm. And so for us, I mean the culture, humility is very hard to inventio or reinventio because, well, think about the process, humiliation. That's not a, that's not a positive word. Yeah. That's a, dev- that's a word of devastation and destruction and loss, right? So what is it we need to do to and habilitate, inhabit, yeah. habit, humility. Re- 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 rehabilitate humility? Well, I think, I, I really, I think that we have an opportunity. It's a little, it's, it's annoying because it's a very pressing opportunity, is that we have, we have a tendency today to self-name for people yes. who want to auto-originate. Yes, yes. Uh, and when we see that, we notice what it does. It creates a very strange, it, it creates a very strange instability when people try to self-name. And you could imagine that the image of self-naming in, in the Bible, the idea of taking the apple for ourselves, or especially Babel, right, the idea where we will build, make for ourselves a name, we'll reach heaven and make for ourselves a name, that doesn't work. Uh, because of that, because of just the levels, the, how, yeah, the, yeah. how reality works, like you yeah. said, for you to be able to quantify anything, the name already has to be given. Yes. For you to be able to, be able to calculate anything, the identity has already to be, it has to be already yes. there, yes. right? And so, yes. and so that's, the, that's the scale, like that's this relationship. And so if you understand that, then humility is just the proper stance in front of, before life, which is that I cannot, re, I cannot will myself into existence. I have to receive from heaven, or receive from above, or receive from the past, receive from tradition, receive from, from that which was, that, that is not me, who I am. And without that, I, I can't, you know, I, I'll, just, I'll just fragment and collapse and, and start to break apart. That's really good. So first of all, 
part of what I'm hearing is uh, humility is an, appro uh, uh, an appropriately apprehensive appreciation of the vertical. Yeah. So, right? Something like that, an appropriate apprehension of the vertical. So you, un like, you understand that much is being given. Uh, and, and it could also be this way, too, right? Mm -hmm. what, what is, like, how the earth gives, and, 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 and right? right? Yeah, well, I mean, that, the idea yeah. that the, that body comes from, also comes from, yeah. from, yeah, from right. outside. So I think that that's, that's very, very powerful. Two things. Um, humility seems to also be, have within it a recognition of one's faults, failures, and finitude. Um, that's the opposite of hubris. Mm -hmm. So yeah. how, how that gets in. And then thirdly, how do we not crush the fact that there is an aspect, and this is the existentialists made a big deal of this, and some of them were Christians, right? That we, there's a big aspect of us that is self-defining, self-interpreting. And part of being, you being Jonathan is the way in which you have Right, to find yourself, and uh, like there, there is that's one of the ways in which we're reliably different from other organisms on the planet. Right. So how do first of all how how does the recognition? I'll just use finitude for how does that fit into that? And then how how do we not crush that part of us that is appropriately understood as yeah. our capacity for self-definition? So I would say the the first one in terms of in terms of of, uh, of being humble and ha and recognizing your fault and all that, one of the problems, the reason why that has been so diseased in the past few centuries, is I think precisely because we don't think that. Mm -hmm. Someone who really thinks they're wretched usually doesn't have a problem. The problem is usually people who think they're wretched but really think they're not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And so, and so they, they have this perception of their wretchedness, but they think they should be something else. So because of that, they, li they experience it as a kind of oppression and a kind of, 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 uh, of, of bitterness. Oh, so there's, what, just, but, but if you read, if you read the, 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 great, the great fathers, like this sense of, of being empty you know, yeah. and of, of seeing your faults, if you don't think you have, you have much, then, then all your faults just become opportunities for you to get better. Like that's all they are. They're just opportunities. All your sins become opportunities. All your faults become opportunities. And again, I'm not doing that, just so you know. <laughs> Sometimes, but not most of the time. But I, I can kind of see that. And I think that, that the, 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 even the whole idea of self-esteem that the modern West has developed. Self-esteem has been a failure. Oof. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> no, 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 seriously. <laughs> the, the empirical data is self-esteem has been a failure. Okay, like if, if, if either, either we say it's a rational scientific project and we make predictions and we, then we get the disconfirming evidence or we're playing some game. Hmm. And of course the culture to a large degree is playing some game, right? Um, and and I, I agree, put that aside. But if you look at the data, self-esteem has been a mistake. So, but then the, the idea of, this, of the self-naming or the, the actualization, I think that that can be experienced uh, as uh, a, a self-transcendence. Yes. Right? But it's, it's not self-transcendence in the sense of just picking yourself up by your bootstraps no, no. and lifting yourself up. It's, the, it's, it's very much like the idea of following a leader. Right? So someone, something appears to you as bright and as beautiful and powerful and it pulls you, right? It kind of, kind of gives you that, that oomph to move, to move into it. So you, you obviously participate in that, but you don't have it in you. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's like there, there, are, there are things that are that are guiding you and pulling you. Whether it's, you know, whether it's you're you're playing sport and there are sports players before you that are superstars and, the, and those examples are kind of yeah, moving you forward and are, are aspirational. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is, and and and, I, and I, I'm going to bring in the the Platonic thing about, you know, the aspirational, the appropriate aspirational appreciation of the vertical that is properly binding together the finitude and the transcendent. Mm -hmm. How's that for humility? Yeah. Do you no, like I th that? I think that's fine, yeah, I think it's good. Yeah, we can, I think humility, but it's, it's good that you bring up humility because it's true that it's something that most people think is uh, horrible. We have a sense that, that humble people are weak, uh, but I, you know, there, there are interesting stories of humility uh, that show the strength of, of humility. And Saint, Fra <clears throat> Saint Francis of Assisi is a great example. Yes. There are many examples where he humbles himself in a way that, 
actually almost secretly raising himself above everybody else. He's not, he's not doing it, but it's happening yeah. you know, by the fact that he's lowering himself and he's shaming everyone around, around him to a point where everybody recognizes that he's the, he's the master. So I'm not claiming to do this either. <laughs> but, but, yeah. um, I do, I mean, this is sort of meta. I aspire to being more humble because for me, I want to more, that what we just talked about, that, that, that it's not the poles, it's the polarity, right? Mm. That, that, that aspiration, appropriately aspirational appreciation. And appreciation means understanding as well as valuing, right? Uh, of the, the, the binding of the finite and the transcendent mm. together. I want to, I aspire, not just want, want, who cares about my wants? I aspire to be in the stance, the orientation, so that the love of what is true and good and beautiful can grow in me. Mm -hmm. And for me, that is how I try to practice the aspiration towards humility. Mm. Does that land for you? Yeah. yeah. No, I think that's great. And I think that that's, and I, I agree, I think that, you do sometimes appear, that's why some people think you're kind of Christian-like, because you, <laughs> because you, because you, because you. I can have Christianity, or I can have Christian, Christian light. light. <laughs> you can choose. But no, but that, the fact that you, that you seem to have taken up uh, uh, humility and agape and the virtues that Christian recognize as being that which leads towards the good, and because you often embody them, you know, people see you and, and, and are, so, I mean, are taken by, by, your, by your stance in life. So, so yeah. yeah, don't you agree? Some yeah. of you, yeah. <laughs> the, 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 Socrates is not my only sage. I have, like I say, I have a symphony of sages. And I, given what you just did, I hope you'll hear this in the right way. Jesus is also one of my sages and he will, he will always be that. And I've wrestled with that, and I've come to, well, for at least, me, at least now, a place of peace around mm -hmm. that. Um, so if you're seeing that, um, I hope this isn't disrespectful, some of the credit goes to, to Jesus. For me, some of the credit also goes to Siddhartha and to Socrates, but yes, I wanna give, I always like to give credit where credit is due. And so, um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Um, I, 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 uh, I value that. I mean, I've had a, a tortured relationship, at least early on, and you did too, to some degree, with Christianity. Um, and I have criticisms of it, and you, I've voiced some of them. Um, but I always, it all, it, at least imaginally for me, like Jesus is alive in me in that way. Uh, I don't consider myself a Christian because I think there's other, uh, because I don't want to water down what, I have respect for Christianity, I don't want to water it down, right? I don't want to. You, you have specific claims about history and, and, and I, 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 right? But uh, I just want to give credit. I, I was brought up and then, you know, and I've, I, I've returned in some ways to, I hope, a right relationship within myself with Christianity through Tillich and you know, interacting with, uh, with uh, a whole bunch of thinkers, David Schindler, who I've now met, and you and Paul. And, um, and, and I hope, um, I feel that there's been a lot of movement within me uh, so that um, I can hopefully, ah, I'm invoking hope, I can invoke hopefully at times um, let that part of me shine through in a way that is valuable to other people. Mm -hmm. That's great, yeah. So, I, I, how much time do we I have left? I think we should end there. Yeah, I, I know, think we're, we're done. Really, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what